Welcome to Explore Europe, a podcast series for American military stationed in and around Germany. Each episode brings you travel tips and local secrets to help you get the most out of your time overseas with your hosts, Michelle Peirce and John Sweeney, who have been living in Germany and exploring Europe for over 15 years. So, where should we explore today? Well, there's only one way to find out. It's on with the show. Good morning, Michelle. I'm in Ramstein. You're in Mannheim. And uh, what have we got today? Well, John, it's the last episode of our very first series. So we're going big. This episode, we are visiting my favourite city in the entire world and somewhere I have worked for many years and go back to very, very often. We are going to the city of London in the United Kingdom. London is a big one. Um, I love London. I had the privilege of working in London for a few years. I was on a push bike biking around London. So I got into lots of, if people have listened before, lots of nooks and crannies. <laughs> so I'm very, very interested to see your perspective of London and how does it compare to mine and what do other people think? Absolutely. And I think that for our listeners who are based in Germany for two or three years, one visit to London is not enough. You have definitely got to plan two, maybe even three weekends in London while you're based here. So this first episode is going to be your London primer. And I'm basing it on as much as you can do in London for as little money as possible. So the whole idea is that you go to London and you are not paying to go into any of the big attractions, no Madame Tussauds, no Tower of London, nothing like that. This weekend that we're giving you is all about walking around and taking in the sights externally, um, getting finding as many things as possible to do for free, visiting as many attractions as possible for free, just soaking up London, really having a good recce and then planning a return trip, highlighting the areas that you'd really like to dive into. I think the problem that many people have with London is they over plan it before they go. They find it incredibly difficult to fit in what they want to do. And because it's expensive. Oh, it's it's it can be hugely expensive. But the tips I'm going to give you in this episode are going to give you the best way to see London on the least amount of money possible. So it's a really great primer. And one of the things that people often do is, like I said, they overbook things, they go from place place to place and they're missing out on the real London which is actually what happens in between all of the big attractions because London is is something that you experience you don't just visit okay I I I love the sound of that absolutely love the sound of that so let's go we're talking about London it's a it's a massive massive city we have I believe I'm going to get this wrong definitely get this wrong there's 30 or 32 different boroughs or councils for London. So there's lots of different places to go to. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to focus mostly on the central areas of London for this episode. But even so, that covers quite a lot. So when we get stuck into it, I'm going to explain how I think you should break up your weekend in London. And I'm kind of going to assume that we're going on a Friday to a Sunday or Friday to Monday. So maybe a three full days in London is what I'm going to base this episode on. Okay, great. Well, let's say you're traveling from Germany. Mm -hmm. We're going to travel from Ramstein. We're going to travel from Wiesbaden. We're going to travel from Stuttgart. What's the best way to get to London? Okay, well, I know your favourite way to get to London is by train, and that's using the Deutsche Bahn, then connecting in Paris to Eurostar and going on straight into central London. And I think that's a fantastic way of doing it. But um, And it's as super easy as well. I mean, it's from, from Paris to London is about two hours, so that's great. And from Kaiserslautern to Paris is about three or two and a half hours. Is that right, John? It's about 2.20 from K-Town. Okay. Um, and about three from Mannheim, where you are. Yeah. Um, I love the train, as you know. The only problem with the train is if, if you're one or two, it's probably a good way of doing it. More than that, it's going to be expensive. Okay. And I think you've given us tips before on um, book, looking at trains about three months out from when you want to travel. Is that right? 90 days is, is about the key I found. But if you do 90 to 60 days, but if you're going to London, you 
yeah, you might do it on a whim, but if you're planning London properly, this sounds like a good plan. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the alternative to that is to fly, and there are quite a lot of options for flying to London. Low-cost airlines, you've got Ryanair that fly from Frankfurt Hahn and Frankfurt International, which is the main, Frankfurt Main. Um, they'll fly into Stansted. From Stansted, you can get the Stansted Express into Liverpool Street, which is in central London, but the city part. Another, a great alternative from Stansted is actually the, the um, National Express, the coaches. Um, they're much cheaper. They don't take much uh, longer, to be honest, because even if you go into Liverpool Street, you're going to need to get the, the tube, the London Underground, to your next destination. And if you stay where I'm going to recommend, then the National Express, the bus, the, um, the coach service is going to take you very close to where you need to be. So that's my tip. And I often use that. They're air conditioned and they have Wi-Fi on board. So that's brilliant. Um, you can also fly with... Um, airlines like Lufthansa or BA and they sometimes if you book well in advance sometimes those flights offer really good value and you can probably get better deals on taking luggage but honestly 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 you do not need a lot of luggage when you're going to London a carry-on bag is perfectly sufficient for three days in London so it's a great option for carry-on only um, flight tickets and low-cost airlines. Another great tip that I have for our listeners, because a lot of them are going to come from the KMC or Spangdalem or Wiesbaden, that sort of area. And we touched it in one of the episodes before, and we had a, we had an episode on it before, was Luxembourg. And from Luxembourg, it's now a, about an hour and 10 minutes to the airport. It's all Audubon. You don't have to fly to Frankfurt, drive to Frankfurt Hahn through the forest and stuff. It's all Audubon the whole way. And you get a late night flight. So what that means for me when I'm, I'm thinking about work is I can work on Friday, catch a late night flight, do Saturday and Sunday in uh, London and then catch the late night flight back. To, I've taken no time off work, which is oh, a really good way of doing it. Yeah, that's a great trip. And where does it fly into? It flies from Luxembourg into Stansted. It's Ryanair and they've got their normal cheap prices if you get them early or you, you book them a day before, like I've done once or twice. It becomes quite expensive, but hey-ho, that's, that's how it goes. We know that. Sure. And I think I need to be really, really clear because sometimes I drive back to England if I'm going with um, David and Lola and we're staying for a few a few days or a week or so. But you do not want a car in London. London is not somewhere you should be driving to or around. So unless you are visiting other places in the UK as part of this trip, leave your car behind and use public transport to get to London. Am I right, John? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, London uh, is, as, as you've said, one of the, probably the best city on the planet. To me, if it had a beach and some sun, it would be, it would be the best city on the planet. <laughs> um, but facts about London is just very quickly, it's a city of about 12 million people and it's yeah. growing. Um, there's transportation links that cover absolutely, absolutely everybody. Uh, there's taxis, there's buses, there's the best tube system on the planet use it appreciate it and the good thing for all of us it's all in english absolutely yes <laughs> so in terms of language difficulties london's going to be the easiest city in the world to get around so exactly yeah once we're in london um i've touched a little bit on how to get from stansted into central london um you can also fly from frankfurt main into heathrow and there is a train called the heathrow express which takes you into paddington my super insider's tip is to leave that alone and just take the London Underground. It takes about 15 minutes longer, but it's super cheap, super easy, and you're actually going to experience a little bit of London on the way through, whereas the Stansted Express is just kind of expensive and a bit rubbish, if you ask me. It's had its day. Um, one of the other things I would recommend in terms of transportation-wise is in advance of arriving in London, and I'll put a link to this in the show notes, is register your contactless credit card and use that to tap in and out of the tube stations, buses, um, boats, anything that where you're using public transportation. London has a brilliant all-in-one contactless system and it is the least expensive way to get around the city. If you pre-register a contactless card, so it's got to have the little symbol on it that shows you can pay contactless, um, what will happen is every time you tap in and out of a station, it registers your journey. And at the end of the day, it will calculate the cheapest fare for your whole day's journey and then charge that to your card. And that's by far the least expensive way of getting around London. 
Everybody that travels needs to have their own card, though. So if you're traveling with children, what you might want to do is book in advance something called a, a visitor's oyster card. What was that which again? Is a, pre- a visitor's oyster card. Okay. An oyster card is um, is like a prepay system in London, which people used to use. It's not as popular now because we use contactless for everything. Um, but it's basically you can preload it. And you can tap in and out like a credit card for all of your journeys. And that's just going to make it so much easier to get around London because it, once you get to London and if you're at any of the underground stations or tube stations, as we call them when you're a local, um, you're going to see people queuing up to buy tickets, getting really, really confused. But once you've got either your contactless card or your Oyster card registered, I'll put links into the show notes so you can arrange this all in advance of your trip. Once you've got that, you're basically behaving like a local and you're just tapping in and out nice and quickly just make sure you keep it local nobody's going to thank you for rummaging around the bottom of your handbag to tap in and out of a very very busy tube station you need to have that accessible in a pocket so you can tap in and out quickly that's a really good tip and uh, I I remember when I was working in London I would uh, do the contact payments and I just had it in my wallet and I didn't even need to take it out of my wallet I would just put it on the top of the system yeah. It would accept it and I would move on. So I was moving pretty quickly, which is good. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, you just got to be careful sometimes that there aren't other cards in there that might affect might affect that. So um, That's yeah. a good, good point. Yeah. But if we registered one, it should be okay, right? Yeah, absolutely. And one of my other tips for travelling around London, and this is going to relate to where I recommend that you stay in London, is to use the boats to get around the city. It is a fantastic way to avoid the congestion on the tubes because although the tube system is fantastic, it's also incredibly busy and full of very purposeful Londoners trying to get to work. So a much more relaxed way to travel is to use, they're called the Thames Clippers, and you can buy a a hop-on and hop-off ticket all day using your contactless card. Um, and that will get you to some of the key places that I'm going to recommend during this episode. And I think it's a really, really relaxing way to travel. There's seats on there, there's toilets on there, you can buy drinks, and it's an amazing way to see the city from the river, which is really the heart of London, the River Thames. The whole of the city is built around the River Thames. So it's an amazing way to get around the city and to see it. For somebody who's not a Londoner, which, which you're not, but you've lived there, so yep. I'm going to call you a Londoner. I can't comprehend travelling all the time on on the boats. You know, is it like a Venice with the little canals, or tell me a l- tiny bit more? Okay, so the main the main um, water artery through through London is the River Thames, and I'm just going to bring up my map of London when I when I'm telling you this. So most of where I'm going to recommend that you spend some time during this episode is starts at around Lambeth Bridge or Westminster Bridge, which is southwest of London, and goes all the way to Greenwich, which is southeast of London. All the way along there are river piers with with little stops, and the boats will take you from stop to stop. There's probably altogether about 10 stops. When you first go on, you tap on and off, just like you do with the London Underground, and it it will calculate the best ticket for the day for you. Um, Basically be able to use it just like you would use the tube system or just like you would use a bus and hop on and off all day. That sounds absolutely wonderful. I love the the word hop on, hop off, which we'll come to again shortly, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So you've got the the boats and that sounds a wonderful way of doing it. Uh, The tubes, you and I know very well. Yeah. And the tube system is, I mean, there's maps all over the world that copy the tube system in London or the underground. Um, And it is fantastic and it's a great way to do it. Is it like a New York system where people aren't talking to you on the trains? Are you ready to fight each other or, or, or what's bit. the deal? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, one of the things, I guess one of the criticisms that a few people have when they use the tube system in London is that people aren't terribly friendly and also that they're not air conditioned. And those two things might be linked. So when you're on the tubes, they can be quite busy. People are kind of very purposely either looking at, down at their phones, reading the newspapers, It's probably not the friendliest way to travel, but it is sure is convenient and very, very efficient. Got it. So I'm not going to make friends, right? You're not going to make friends on the tube. No, I'm sorry. (laughs) No worries, but I'm going to get to where I need to go, right? You'll get to where you need to go. But my number one tip for getting around London is to walk. I walk everywhere when I'm in London. 
London is happening all around you. It's an experience. It's not just a destination. So if you walk from one place to the next, you're actually going to see all of these famous sites that you think you need to get on a tube to see or a bus to see. You really don't. From standing on the South Bank, and I'll come to this later, you're going to be able to see the Palace of Westminster, which is the Houses of Parliament, Big Ben, you're going to be able to see the London Eye, you're going to be able to see the back of Covent Garden, you're going to see the MI5 and MI6 buildings, you're going to see some massively famous sites, none of which you will see if you're underground. So put on some comfortable walking shoes and basically use what God gave you and walk around London to get the absolute best out of it. Okay, and I, I love that. I, I love the way you said it. A, a few minutes ago, I talked about how I, I had the, and it was a privilege of working in London for a couple of years mm -hmm. and cycling around from borough to borough, council mm -hmm. state to council state. And I got to find the nooks and the crannies. And what you're saying about walking is brilliant. And what's baffling for a lot of people is the sheer size of London. Mm. But then when you get your walking shoes on, you realise a lot of the major sites you probably want to see are actually within walking distance. Absolutely. And one of the things you're going to find about London is that most of the key sites are all grouped together. So something I have created, and I'm going to link to this in the show notes, is the Explore Europe Guide to London. And I have overlaid lots of itineraries on a Google map to show you where everything is grouped together. And my best recommendation for London is that when you go, is that you choose one area for one day. You go out there either on the boat, the tube or a bus and walk around it. Because in one small area, just let me give you um, one idea. So I've got here something called the London Bridge itinerary and it's on a Google map, which is free for everyone. And I'm going to link to it in the show notes. On the London Bridge itinerary, which is a tiny, tiny little area around London Bridge, and I'm not talking about Tower Bridge, which is the famous, beautiful, very, very ornate bridge, which is also actually quite nearby. But within this one itinerary, you have got something called the Tower Bridge Experience, the Tate Modern Theatre, Shakespeare's Globe, the Millennium Bridge, the Shard, Borough Market, Potter's Field, the Oxo Tower, the National Theatre, the South Bank, and some very, very famous restaurants and very good restaurants. That's all within one itinerary. And I have got nine itineraries on this map. So you could do one, maybe two of those in one day, all on foot once you get there. And you'll find lots and lots of things to do or see within those areas. If you try and rush from, for example, uh, Buckingham Palace to the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, you're going to find that they are very long way apart in London. And in between all of that, you're going to miss lots of other things that are around Buckingham Palace that you should really spend three or four hours exploring. Does that make sense? To me, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think to some of our listeners, it's going to be a, a bit overwhelming. Yeah. Um, it's like going to New York and trying to, to see Brooklyn and Manhattan. You can't really do it all in the same day. Yeah, ex that's exactly, and that's a that's a great reference, actually, John. And I think it will make more sense when when people see the the links to these itinerary that itineraries that okay. I've created for them. Let me first talk about where I think you should stay in London. And there are lots and lots of options for hotels in London. And I guess very similar to New York, a lot of them are quite overpriced, and a lot of them are quite underwhelming. Okay. That's just what we need to hear when doing a budget show. But tell me more. Let's go. Well, I have a good tip for a budget range of hotels. And I use these every time I'm in London. They're not sponsoring these, this podcast. So this is just my personal recommendation. I use a budget hotel chain called Premier Inns. They are very similar standard all across the UK and in London. And especially if you can find a new one, they're great value. If you book well in advance of your trip, you can find some really, really good rates for a Premier Inn hotel. And my recommendation is that you go on their website, you put in the postcode SE1, and look at the first four or five hotels that come up. They're going to give you locations like Bankside, Borough High Street, Waterloo, Westminster Bridge, and Tower Bridge. These are Premier Inn hotels that are all located south of the river. So that's in an area called South Bank or Borough or Bankside. That's all kind of like one continuous area on the south of the Thames. 
it's a really lovely area. Until a few years ago, it probably wasn't somewhere that you'd visit, but now it's somewhere that's been really regenerated. It's full of art galleries, theatres. There's so much to see and do there without spending a penny. The South Bank Centre itself has so much going on there. It has lots of free theatre, free music events. There's street food markets. There's street entertainers. There's usually a fair. And this starts at where the London Eye is and goes all the way down towards Tower Bridge, which is the, yeah, as we said, the very pretty ornate bridge that we see in all the postcards. And that whole area is, I think, a really nice place to base yourself when you're in London. A lot of the other tourist attractions are the other side of the bridge. But all you need to do is walk across either Westminster Bridge or Waterloo Bridge, and you are in the heart of places like Covent Garden or Westminster. So it's quite nice because you come away from the really, really intense busyness of London for where you're staying. But the South Bank, Bankside, Borough area itself has a vibe, a very, very arty vibe all of its own. And I really, really enjoy spending time around there. OK, so you want to we should look at something like the Premier Inn or if we look in Google and, and search for something else, if we look for places to stay in London, a good reference to put down would be SE Sierra Echo One. Yeah, and that correct. would get us pretty damn central. Yeah, that was that's going to give you. Um, it's it's south of central, so it's south of the river. But yeah. in my opinion, it's a great option. It's not quite as expensive as staying in central London, which is uh, which is going to be something like W one or WC one, something like that. And these are the zip, these are zip codes we're talking about here. Got it. So the zip codes, if you're looking at booking the hotels, can be quite important. And for yeah. you and I, we'll get the zip codes because it'll mean Southeast One or it mean yeah. Westminster One. So we know that Central London. But as a as one of our listeners, they might not know that. But SE One is not far from the central places that they may want to go, and it's a little bit away, so we should be a little bit less expensive. Exactly. Exactly. Perfect. And what I love it. <laughs> and one of the great things with the Premier Inn Hotel website is that they will give you two rates. They're going to give you a locked-in rate, which is going to be a bit cheaper, and they're going to give you a pay-on-the-day rate, which means that you could cancel up until I think it's something like one o'clock on the same day. But beware, if you don't turn up, they're going to charge your card for that. But what's great about this is we can use your little trick, John, which is to um, secure the hotel room using the pay-later rate, then go and look for your flights and make sure that you can get reasonable flights. Once you've locked your flights in, you can go back to Premier Inn and secure the pay now rate and get the best deal. Great. That's absolutely fantastic. Now, with Premier Inn, I know they're very good. Uh, they're very clean. They're very tidy. They're, they're a, a good brand of hotels in the UK. Is there anything else out there? There are some more expensive hotels, and it's definitely worth looking on booking.com. So My favourite. Your favourite, John's favourite, <laughs> exactly. Once you've secured a pay later rate on um, the Premier Insight, you could also go on to booking.com and look around the same area and see if there's good deals on slightly more upmarket hotels. Premier Inn also offers something called HubSpot, which are even less expensive hotels, but they are tiny rooms. They are really are... I've stayed in them and I love them because I've stayed in one right next to Tower Bridge, but they are, I don't even know how to describe this. They are literally like, I, I guess if you've ever been on a cruise, they are rooms this size. It's a bed. It's not even a proper wardrobe. There's like a hanging area and a bathroom, but they are beautifully clean, sparkling brand new, but they are budget, budget, budget. It's all about location. But the thing is, John, when you're in London, you're not spending any time in your hotel. It's a waste of money to spend a lot of money on a hotel. But what you want is something clean and safe. Excellent. And that's what you're going to get with some of these hotels. And the staff, I find the, the, the customer service at Premier Inn Hotels to be really, really good. But don't book breakfast. Don't book Wi-Fi because most of the time you can get the, um, the Wi-Fi from the main hotel for free anyway. And in terms of breakfast, their breakfast rooms are usually in a basement. And I'm going to recommend that you just get out into London and find somewhere much better to eat anyway. Talking of breakfast, there's like if you go to a New York or a DC or a Philadelphia, there's coffee shops everywhere. There's good, good brochens, good breakfasts. You can get yourself an English fry up somewhere. They're, they're all over the place. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. So we're in. You found a hotel. 
we're happy, we're in London, we know what we're doing. What activities would you suggest? Okay, so if you're going on something like, let's say you arrive on a Friday, what I'm going to suggest is you pull up my Explore Europe Guide to London on Google Maps and choose an area. So, for example, let's say we're in the Premier Inn in Waterloo, Westminster Bridge, which is somewhere you and I have stayed when we've had family events, right? Yes. From there, you're right outside the London Eye. There also happens to be a Thames Cruiser Pier right there. So you can jump on a boat. I'd recommend perhaps something like getting on the boat and going all the way down to Greenwich, which is in southeast London, getting off at Greenwich Pier and wandering around Greenwich. You've got the Royal Observatory there, um, the Maritime Museum. And this is the other thing that's worth pointing out. All museums in Britain are free. Sorry, one second. Get me on that again. What was that? <laughs> Entrance to museums in Great Britain, including London, are free of charge. Some of them will have special exhibits that you will pay to go into. But basically, when you're going into a museum, it is free. That's wonderful. That is absolutely wonderful. It's amazing. All of them will ask for a donation and absolutely put your hand in your pocket and support this fantastic resource that we have. But yeah, you can go to so you can go to some amazing museums in London. I'm just going to list off a few of them. We have the Science Museum, the British Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Museum of Childhood, Imperial War Museum, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. There are dozens of amazing museums in London and all of them have excellent resources and facilities to keep kids amused. One of the best places that Chloe and I went to, my daughter, and I've been there a few times with many people, is the Natural History Museum, mm -hmm. which is amazing in itself and the area that it's in is brilliant. I'll talk about that in a second. But you walk in and you've got like skeletons of dinosaurs that are five metres tall and ten metres wide and it's, it's absolutely wonderful. And then... If you're an adult and you're bored of looking around at all that, you've got Harrods up the road. You're, you're yeah. in Kensington, which is the most prime real estate on the planet. And you just go around seeing Bentleys and Ferraris driving around. And then all of a sudden, you go back into the Victoria and Albert Museum. Yes, which is absolutely amazing. And I'm glad you brought that up, actually, because that's, that's on the Kensington itinerary, which is in the map. And that's really close to Kensington Palace. Kensington Palace Gardens, which is where the Princess Diana Memorial Fountain and the Memorial Gardens are as well. Again, another place you can go and explore for free. Brilliant. And talking of Kensington, um, I like the Royals. You like the Royals. We've obviously just had the wedding of uh, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan, and we have the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. I believe they reside in Kensington as well. Yes, they do. So uh, both Harry and Meghan and Kate and William um, reside in Kensington Palace. There's apartments in there. So you can get pretty close to where, to where our royal family lives and get up close and personal. Not sure they'll invite you in for tea, but you could try. Well, I might ask them for a beer, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, when I'm, so basically, once you're in your hotel and settled, pick an area, travel to one of these areas, and, and don't plan for anything else. Just wander around and enjoy experience. If you stumble across one of the museums and you fancy it, then go in. If you, You're going to find lots and lots of very traditional British pubs in any of the places that you visit here. They're going to be absolutely fantastic. And in terms of food and drink, although I'm going to give you a few restaurant recommendations, apart from dinner in the evening, if you want a destination to go to, I don't think you need to make that many bookings in London. And I will tell you for why, John. London has some of the best food markets and street food vendors in the world. One second, Michelle. Sorry, um, I'm sorry to butt in. I love London. I've said it 10 times this already. England doesn't have the best reputation in the world for food. I think the food in England these days is absolutely fantastic. Some of the best in the world, especially food markets and street food. It's very international, so it's not just UK-based fish and chips, although you will get great fish and chips in London, but not at any of the fancy restaurants. Um, just behind the South Bank, so if you're staying on South Bank, where I'm recommending, just behind the South Bank Centre, which is a, a, a big building, it's quite a modern-style building, it was built in the 50s, it's called the Festival Hall. There is an amazing, uh, real. it's called the Real Food Market. And when I stay in London, I get up in the morning and I go there for breakfast. I don't go anywhere else. I might go and get a toasted bagel or a falafel or porridge or anything. There's, you can find any kind of food there. 
freshly made. From there, often I will walk all the way along the Thames down towards Tower Bridge and go to somewhere called Borough Market, which is one of the most famous food markets in London. That should conveniently be around lunchtime. From there, you can graze around the food markets there too. It's absolutely fantastic, John. And I kind of feel like sometimes if you book a restaurant in London, you're wasting an opportunity to actually discover some, you know, random food or some street food or a food fair or just to experience something, as I say, on the hoof, so on the fly, something very, very incidental, unplanned. I, f- I feel like when you're in London, you need to leave as much time to do unplanned things as possible, and that includes food. I, hey, I totally agree. Um, and I've been to our market many, many, many times and had breakfast, lunch and dinner flying around when I'm, I'm walking around and biking around, and it was wonderful. And it's the, the different, for instance, you've got bananas, oranges, and then all of a sudden there's somebody next door doing a kebab or there's somebody doing prawn sandwiches, and it's just a complete mixture of different things that you've just got to go and experience. I mean, London is an experience completely, and with the diversity of London, I believe it's probably the most diverse city on the planet. The food brings the people as well, and the locals, it's not just the tourists, the locals need to eat. And they're not just going to eat all the touristy food, they will eat their local food. And if they're Indian, Pakistani, American, Chinese, English, Irish, Mm -hmm. whatever, they want a bit of their own food somewhere. Absolutely. And you are going to find just a huge range of diverse options in all of these street food markets. Um, There is another fantastic market that I highly recommend as well. Um, And that is called Spitalfields Market. And that's on the East Itinerary on my Google map. And that's very close to where I spent a long time living uh, in East London. Spitalfields Market is an amazing place full of either food stalls or artisan stalls. So you'll get homemade clothing, cool record stalls. It's, It's very much a hipster paradise. So it's, you know, it's kind of very edgy, very cool. You're going to find some amazing coffee shops there. Uh, I noticed recently that there was a Chanel store in there, which disappointed me a bit because I think that's kind of changes the experience slightly. But there's also some nice sit down restaurants in there as well. Um, I often take my parents to a place called Canteen, which is kind of like what it sounds like. It has wooden tables. You sit at long banks of tables, sometimes sharing them with strangers. Um, But Canteen sells really English food. So if you are interested in getting... Uh, an English pie with mashed potatoes and gravy, for example, then you can get that at Canteen and they do like set menus for 15 quid. You can get a starter and a main course, that kind of thing. And I really love sitting in Canteen in the middle of Spitalfields Market with all the market traders all around me and just having some really nice English food there. And that's a great place to explore. And again, that's uh, that's the East Itinerary. It's right next to an area called Brick Lane, which is somewhere I lived right on top of when I was in London and had some of the best curries in the world. It's a very, yeah, you, I got you excited then, didn't I, John? It's a Bangladeshi area. It used to be, it's Jewish and Bangladeshi area. So you get amazing bagels and amazing curries. It's just a food lover's paradise. Well, I'm, I'm glad you just mentioned that because I was about to, to throw it all in there. Um, in England, straight away, if you're coming as a tourist, you're going to think of fish and chips. You're going to think mm-hmm. maybe of pies. Um, but curry has become the national dish of England. And Brick Lane is probably the best place in the country to eat a proper curry. I think outside of the north of England, definitely. And what's cool about some of those places, it's not quite not quite as much as it used to be, but a lot of them are unlicensed. So if you want to t- drink a beer or a, bo- or a glass of wine, you bring your own, which makes it just such an inexpensive meal as well. Yeah, you've got to bear in mind, you know, it, the, the house prices, the rent prices are astronomical in that area. Um, you've got mm. people that are 40 years old sharing apartments with another five people so they can all afford to live. So when they're going out, there is inexpensive good food available in lots of places not everywhere because you know there are the very expensive places but you get out there and really experience it and a little unknown fact that you may not know is the beats headphones that dr dre just sold to apple yeah um when he started really making the money on them it was the london olympics in 2012 what he did a brilliant marketing idea was he got invites to all the athletes and said, come pick up your new, brand new Dr. Dre Beats headphones. 
from a house in Brick Lane. No way. Yes, and that's how he got it. So when at the 2012 Olympics, everybody's wearing these big Beats headphones, that's where it all came from. So he was getting them all to go to this house in Brick Lane. They had to go personally and pick up, and that's when they're all on the TV, and they got so much exposure because everybody, all the athletes in the Olympics wanted to wear them. Oh, wow. Well, I find, I find the whole Brick Lane and Spitalfields area of the East such a cool area. There's some great markets there on a Sunday. There's something called Columbia Road Flower Market, which opens um, at the weekends as well. And it's just so beautiful. Like this one street in London where on one day of the week, basically it's just filled with flowers and plants. It's absolutely glorious. And then there's Brick Lane Market on a Sunday, which is just full of what I would call toot. It's mainly rubbish. It's cheap clothes and bric-a-brac and things like that. But these things are just have their own atmosphere and they really are kind of part of the culture of London. And if you want to experience London like a Londoner, then these are the places that you go to. And they're all on this itinerary that we'll link to. Excellent. Well, that's great. Now, we're talking about food, which is, as you've said before, your favourite topic and probably uh-huh. one of my favourite topics, if not my favourite. We're doing food on the budget. Um, we're doing mm-hmm. the trip on the budget, but let's just say I wanted to splash out a little bit and go somewhere nice. I'm guessing London's going to have one or two nice places to go. Just a few. And um, if you want to go somewhere not spontaneously, if you want to have a destination, then you definitely need to book a restaurant. So a couple of tips. First of all is to download an app called Open Table. Which it's is a great app. It's a great app. So that's going to give you options of finding a restaurant at reasonably short notice. But you could also download it while you're here in Germany and book in advance. Um, I have a recommendation for a small chain in London that's not too expensive. And on a Sunday, they have a like an all you can eat special, which is kind of cool. And it's a bar called um, Picks, which is they they serve. I think it's called Pintos. Um, they're basically it's Portuguese tapas. So it's tapas, but it comes on like a sliced baguette. And on Sunday, they've got about six, uh, six locations all around London in Soho, Covent Garden, Carnaby, Notting Hill. Um, actually, I think they've got two in Soho and two in Notting Hill. Um, and you don't need to book, but you could, you could book, especially if you want to go in as a, as a group, because they're very, very small restaurants. They're kind of like, it's like going into a little cave. They're quite am- atmospheric. And they basically have this running bar of all of these different tapas. And I think it's about for £30, you can have as much tapas and as much cava, which is basically uh, Spanish Portuguese champagne, um, as much as you can eat and drink up until around five o'clock in the afternoon. So it's kind of a really cool vibey little restaurant where you could go as a group. If you've been shopping, and that's the other thing, of course, all the shops are open on Sundays in London. If you've been shopping and you want to, break then you can go to one of these restaurants and just really spend a few hours having quite a lot to drink quite a lot to eat that probably sort you out for the day so that's a pretty good tip if that's not too expensive okay good well i'm going to throw a tip in as well okay um one that you definitely need to book unfortunately so you need to plan around it um we're talking about budget travel we're talking about doing london as a reconnaissance trip and uh just seeing it for the first time and going back and doing more. But Chloe and I, my daughter again, I keep bringing her up today. She's going to love me on this podcast, I'm sure. We went last time I was in London to a restaurant called The Ivy. And The Ivy is a really, really nice restaurant. It's not Michelin star gourmet. It's not going to blow your mind. It's not going to dent mm-hmm. the pockets massively. But it's really cool. It's really trendy. It's got a 1930s type vibe to the. Yep. They've got three or four restaurants to the one that we went into. You felt like you're in Chicago in Al Capone eras. Yeah, we went to the Ivy and Chloe loved it. And she just had wow. fish and chips and I had something else. And the vibe was nice. And you're bang smack in the middle of theatre land. So mm. if you're going to see a show, if you're doing it on this trip or the next trip, you're there. Everything's in walking distance. And the Ivy is a celebrity haunt. So you might spot one or two celebrities while you're there, if that's your thing. Yeah, that's a great tip. I'm going to come back to the theatre tickets, to visiting the theatre shortly. But let me give you a couple of other restaurants that I quite like. Okay. Um, There's a place called Duck and Waffle, which is in the city of London. 
Again, all of anywhere we're recommending by name, you must book well in advance. Duck and Waffle, for example, I think you have to book it like three or four weeks in advance just to get in. But it's at the top of one of the skyscrapers. Um, you go in downstairs and go up on a huge lift. So the view is fantastic. The food's fabulous. Their specialty is a confit of roasted duck on a waffle, but they also offer lots of other lots of other choices as well. Um, it's a bit like tapas style, so they're quite small dishes, so you might order three or four for the table. They do amazing cocktails, and yeah, I really like that place, and it's open 24 hours. So if you want to go somewhere like two o'clock in the morning for a late night breakfast or something, or an early morning breakfast, then Duck on Waffle is the place to go. So that's a great tip. Um, something I would recommend to do before you go there, if you're in that area, so that's in the city of London which is not far from I guess Tower Bridge and the Tower of London um, is something called Sky Gardens and this is a great tip if any of you have heard of the Shard which is the tallest building in London you can pay about £33 to go up the Shard I think we've done that with um, with your mum John right when we yeah, went as a yeah. family yeah. yeah we took her up to the Shard and it's an amazing view and it's really incredible however for free the alternative is to go to Sky Gardens. Sky Gardens, if you go before 6.30 in the evening, you need to book. And this is my recommendation. Book to go at quarter to six in the evening. You'll need to queue up. It's, there's high security to get in there. You'll need to take ID. You can't wear sneakers, so you need to be reasonably smartly dressed. It's absolutely free to get in. You'll need to book about two to three weeks at least in advance to get in there. Go up to the top of Sky Gardens. There is an amazing bar up there. The bar is not cheap. Just to give you an idea, I paid £18 for a glass of champagne. However, I could have two of those for the same price as it cost me to go up to the Shard that didn't include a drink. The view from up there is incredible. Absolutely incredible. You can see the whole of London for free, including the Shard. So you're actually getting all of the sites in London. They've got a beautiful garden up there. So you can walk all the way around the top. It's called Sky Gardens for a reason, right? Amazing gardens. You can buy a drink at the top of the bar, in the bar. You don't have to buy a drink. I just like to because I think I'm here for the experience. So I'm going to do that. You can spend, you're supposedly supposed to spend about, I think, an hour or 90 minutes there, but nobody kicks you out. But what we did was we went there, we got the last ticket in before you queue. After 6.30, there's no booking system, so you just queue. The queues can be horrendous, so just, just book the last slot in. Have a pre-dinner drink up there. Enjoy Sky Gardens for about an hour and a half. There are some really nice restaurants up there as well, but they're quite expensive. And then from there, go on to somewhere like Duck and Waffle in the area or another restaurant. You've basically got a whole lovely evening for less than the price of going into the Shard. Well, that's a, a, a very good tip, especially if you're travelling with children. So that's a, a wonderful tip. So it's Sky Gardens and it's in it's in the east end of London. It's in the city of London, so not quite east. I'll put okay. a link, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And I think it's the best. It's not quite a secret, but so many people pay to go into the Shard. And I think Sky Gardens is obviously it's free, so it's much better value and the views are much better. And then you can see the Shard from it. So you're kind of getting all of the famous sites of London in one trip. I think it's well worth it. OK, well, talking of sites of London in one trip, we haven't amazingly talked about my favourite form of travel for London, the hop on, hop off bus. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's true. We haven't discussed that yet. And I think it's definitely worth definitely worth doing when you're in London, actually. I think it's about it's not the cheapest hop on and hop hop off bus, but it's going to give you some all of your bearings, isn't it? Well, for me, that was when I went with Ramona for the first time, uh, probably three or four years ago. And bearing in mind, you live there, I work there, I, I know the area pretty well, you do as well. I was blown away by what the tour guides were telling me. And really? it was absolutely brilliant, some of the information. And I think most of those hop-on-off buses have tour guides rather than uh, the audio. Yeah, the hop-on-off bus in London is definitely worth doing. It gives you bearings. It takes you to wherever you need to go. And it, they give you a lot of stories and histories about the place. So I would certainly recommend a hop-on-off bus tour. And they're probably, what, £25-ish? Yeah, I think that's good for, is that good for 24 hours in London? I think it might be. When I used it, it was 24 hours. 
Um, and £25, depending on the fluctuation of exchange rate, is about $35, $40. So it's mm-hmm. not cheap. But it's excellent value for money because you can literally go around, do the tour for three or four hours, whatever it takes. Then next time, jump off and explore a little more, more in the areas you want to go to. It, mm-hmm. I think it's good value for money for a trip when you go in. Maybe not the first trip, maybe the second trip or whatever. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great tip, actually, and I'd forgotten to mention that in the start, because obviously being relatively local, I tend not to do that, but I think it is a great way to get your bearings around London. And actually, it would probably all of these itineraries that I'm talking about that I've got on the Google Maps, it would probably loop them all together. So from your hop-on and hop-off trip, you could kind of decide which area you wanted to go back and focus on, then pull up one of these itineraries, get out, put some comfy walking shoes on, and just go and explore, right? Absolutely. And uh, that's what that's what we like. We like exploring, which is why we're doing this. One of the best things about London, um, and I've done it many times, I've mentioned it before, I've, and I've been with my daughter many, many times. She's going to hate me because I keep mentioning Chloe in this, but hey-ho, it is what it is, um, is the theatre. Theatre land and the theatre. We mentioned the Ivy uh, just a minute ago, but the theatre land is immense. Yes, Shows in London, theatre shows in London are definitely something you could experience. And I think it's something that you could add on to this first trip as well. But I wouldn't plan it in advance. Um, So Theatre Land in London is in an area called Soho, which is, and Soho and Covent Garden, which is just the other side of the river to the South Bank. So you could walk over Westminster Bridge, or probably better would be Waterloo Bridge, and then you're in the heart of Covent Garden, and that's the start of the Theatre Land. There are dozens of shows on in the West End of London or in theatre land, musicals, comedies, political shows. One of the things I would say is London theatre is very, very liberal. So if you're easily offended, be really careful about what you're booking. Um, This first trip, unless you've got something very, very specific in mind to go and see, I would recommend going to the Tickets London booth in Leicester Square which is the official London Theatre returns booth. So you can go there and queue up. You have to do this in person, but I can send you a link to the website so you can see how it works. You can go up and queue there in person and find out what tickets are discounted for that day. So it'll either be people bringing back tickets that they can't use or unsold tickets for shows. And you can get up to about 40 to 50% off some of the tickets there by doing it that way. You may find that you're not all sitting together because, again, these are going to be unsold tickets, but it's a super way of getting to see a show for a lot less expensive. London theatre tickets are really expensive these days. You can be paying over £100 for some of the tickets, which I find a bit much. But by going to the booth in Leicester Square, you can get some, you know, you might be able to go and see, for example, Bat Out of Hell, the musical, for £22.50, something like that, which is quite a significant discount. Or I think 42nd Street at the moment, there's tickets on sale there for £32.50, which is 50% off. Things like that. It it can make quite a big difference um, because theatre prices, if you're a group of four or something, you know, can set you back maybe 400 quid. And I think that's quite a lot of money to pay. That's a hell of a lot of money to pay. Um, Unless you really, really want to go to that show and you're booking Mm -hmm. in advance, probably not want to spend that money. But what Chloe and I have done on many, many occasions is travel down and gone exactly to that ticket booth you're talking about. And we've just picked for what we thought was the best show, the best price for the day. And we've had a great time. But another tip I've just learned, and uh, mm-hmm. I found one or two in, in the last few years of my travels, is if you're booking a ticket, you want to see a show, it's a specific show, and you're booking a ticket, book it in advance. When you're booking your flights, book the restricted access tickets. Because oh. they, are, they are peanuts, right? So the normal ticket might be £100. Mm-hmm. The restricted access ticket might be £25. And what's the difference? And, well, they may say that there's something in front of you and you can't see the stage quite clearly or, or whatever. I went to see War Horse, and Chloe and I seen War Horse, and we were literally uh, on the balcony overlooking the stage and couldn't quite see about 3% of the stage. Wow. And got the tickets for Peanuts, and War Horse was brilliant. Most recently, went to see School of Rock, and I booked the restricted tickets Unbeknown to me, the restricted tickets were front row, but at the end of the front row. And literally when the people are coming out and rocking the guitars on the front row, they're there in front of us. And that was that's why they called it restricted. So we, are, we could have literally touched the actors on the stage, but you were so close, they called it restricted. And we paid 50, 60% less than the normal ticket. 
Wow, that's a fantastic tip. So I will include in the show notes, I'm going to include the um, link to the, the booth in Leicester Square so you can get an idea of how it is how it works but you have to go there in person to get these cheaper tickets i will also include the official london theater ticket website so if you do want to book in advance you can do that another tip i have is also is to book a matinee so an afternoon performance because i feel like if you book an evening you kind of lose your evening you don't have enough time to have dinner before you don't have enough time to have dinner afterwards and although most restaurants will offer these um very quick and slightly less expensive theater menus i just feel like you kind of you lose out on some time if you do that. Better to go to the theatre in the afternoon, come out and just enjoy your evening. Yeah, we've, I've done that many times with Chloe and I'd agree with that one. Okay, so we've done the theatre. What else What else would be there to do in London? Oh, John, there's, there's so much to do. Um, I think museums is something that I'd really, really recommend and we've, we've touched on that before. One of the other things I would suggest is as soon as you arrive in London is to go to a newsstand and pick up a magazine called Time Out. Um, it's free. You might also find it available at um, tube stations as well. It's completely free. And it's going to give you listings for that week of pretty much anything that's on in London. You are going to find that there will be festivals on every piece of green almost every time of year. There will be children's activities. There will be street theatre. There will be something for you to do for either no money or very little money on every day of every week, whenever you visit London. And Time Out is kind of like the Bible of where to find and what to do. Brilliant. So it's called Time Out, not as we'd expect it to say, Time Out. And it's got everything in that we need, right? Absolutely, everything that you need. So if you are, for example, uh, decided that you want to be in Westminster because you want to look at Big Ben or Buckingham Palace or the Churchill War Rooms or Trafalgar Square any of the other big sites, then you can look in, in time out and see what else is on in that area okay. and tie that into your itinerary. Because again, as we've said before, if you're trying to go from one side of London to the other to meet any kind of deadline, you could end up being disappointed because you're going to find it really difficult to, to fight your way through the crowds. And I think actually that's a, something else I want to mention about London. London is a very, very busy city. I think it's busier than New York. People are a little bit more determined in terms of, you know, walking with the head down to, to where they need to go. Don't be in a hurry yourself. If you're not in a hurry to get somewhere in London, you are not going to find it as stressful as other people do. If you're using the boats to get around London, you're not going to find it stressful. If you're walking around London, you're not going to find it stressful. It's only stressful if you have a deadline, if you put yourself under pressure to be somewhere quickly, if you allow yourself to get drawn into that kind of stressful environment. Do what I do. Just go there, look up, look at the sights around you. Just take it all in. If, if you're tired, sit down and have a coffee. Sit by the river on a bench and have a coffee. You don't need to be anywhere fancy to get the best out of London. No, no I totally agree. And um, one of the things I've done on many, many, many occasions, and I, I thoroughly enjoy it, is when I was biking around London and going from site to site, is London and England in general has some fantastic supermarkets. You can yeah. go in and pick up a great sandwich and some great side dishes to go with it. You can pick up an Indian meal that you can eat sitting on a park bench. So if you're travelling around London, you don't need to do it expensive. Stop off in a Sainsbury's or a Waitrose or a Marks and Spencer's or, or whatever they've got. Buy a little bit of food. Stop in one of the loads of great green spaces they have and sit in a bustling city, but in tranquility. It really is a nice way of doing it. Yeah. London has a huge amount of green spaces and you're not going to discover them if you're underground on the tube. And again, this is why I recommend the boats or buses or on foot. Um, we, ha we have some amazing parks and open spaces in London and all of them are just super places to rest, to just take some time out. And despite what people tell you, the weather's not always terrible in London. I always have really great weather whenever I go there. So, you know, you can just take some time out in these green spaces and just experience the atmosphere. Definitely. OK, so we travelled around London, we jumped on tubes, we've jumped on buses, we've been on boats. It's been wonderful. But are the kids going to enjoy what we've done? I mean, we touched on museums. Is that it or is there other stuff to do? There's lots of stuff to do. And one of the things I would recommend is, again, picking up time out because there are activities for kids taking part 
all over London and so much for free. But every single one of these, the sites that you go to in London and the museums and the parks, all of them have special activities put on for kids. There will be certain climbing frames, amazing climbing frames, actually. I've seen some incredible um, very, very creative climbing frames and parks for children all over London. They're going to enjoy being on the buses. They're going to enjoy seeing things like Tower of London because you will see, you don't have to go in to, and you'll, from from a distance, from walking around outside the Tower of London, you can see the guys all dressed up in their suits. You don't need to be in many of these places to actually see some of the cool sites. So I would say there is lots to do in London. I know, for example, that the Imperial War Museum has this amazing like spy masters activity for children. I think you do need to pay for that. But there's so much to do for children in London. And a lot of it is going to be street based entertainment, parks or activities that are put on for free inside museums. Brilliant. Well, that, that's good to hear. So we've got the kids covered. We've had food, we've had a drink, we've got a bed to sleep in. What about spending money? Spending money. Well, that's kind of easy, actually. Although um, you don't spend dollars in the UK because we use Great British Pounds and you'll need to change them. So euros aren't accepted either. There, are, You're going to find exchanges everywhere and card is king. You can use a, a credit card or a visa card all over London, even for the smallest things. You could buy a coffee with your visa card. So maybe keep a small amount of cash of, of pounds on you, which you can change at the airport or there'll be numerous exchange places, especially in tourist areas. Um, you can pull money out of cash machines, which are everywhere. But yeah, plastic is great in London. Great. So coming from Germany, where plastic isn't king and it, cash is king, going to London, we literally, I'm not saying don't need any cash. We should always have a bit of cash in our pockets when you're traveling. But we could do most of it all with the card. Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. And then ATMs, you, you mentioned cash machines, ATMs. They're everywhere, right? Absolutely everywhere. Great. So what I've done when I've travelled is I use the bigger banks that you know some of our American listeners might have heard of, Barclays or HSBC, mm. and I use those bigger ones and there's less of a fee to pay than when I'm using some small banks. Exactly. If you check what um, group your bank belongs to and then just keep an eye out for those and sometimes there's no fees at all. Got it. Um, and just going back a little bit, we didn't talk about, we touched on it, uh, you mentioned the Great British pubs, which <laughs> is a very big thing for me. I enjoy the pub, the, the the pubs. Pubs are everywhere, and are kids allowed in the pubs? What's what's the deal? Yeah, they are because most pubs also serve food as well. So um, somewhere like Covent Garden, for example, you're going to find lots of family restaurants sitting alongside lots of pubs. Now you're going to find that the pubs, um, especially towards the end of the day, are going to get very, very busy. So it might be that you prefer not to take the kids into into pubs, sort of, you know, after about four o'clock, because they will you will find they will be very, very busy. But yeah, they're absolutely welcoming them. That's great to know because lots of my friends have visited England. They want to get to an English pub and sit down and have a pint of a glass of craft beer. We call it real ale in England yeah. and really just soak up that atmosphere. But the kids are welcome normally until about eight, nine o'clock. But it gets busy at the end of the working day. Yeah, absolutely. OK, I, obviously, I go to England. Uh, I'm half English, half Irish. People get very confused. I've got an English accent and an Irish passport, but I'm a bit of both. I think I'm Irish. Other people say I'm English. I can get into England. No problem. What's it like for some of our American friends? Um, as long as they have a passport with more than six months validity on it, you're golden. You'll be given a landing card to fill out um, on the plane. And so when you come through to immigration, you'll just go through a different channel than people with EU passports. But other than that, it's really, really straightforward. Some of my friends have arrived here in Germany without a passport. And some of them have been told they can travel to England with orders. What do you know on that? It's uh, I think only if you're working. I think if you're going to Mildenhall or Lakenheath on orders, then that's fine. But if you're going as a tourist, you're going to need a passport. So get the to the embassy and get yourself a passport. Got it. Okay, that's a good tip because, you know, we can travel around here and we don't need the passports all the time. But going to England, it's obviously part of the EU, maybe not soon because of Brexit, but they have border control, which we don't have. Yeah, and it's actually stricter border control than um, the rest of Europe anyway. And that's a great tip. And actually, whenever you're travelling around London, 
keep your passport on you and keep it safe. Um, you're going to need it. There are places where you're going to be asked to show ID and ID in England generally means your passport. You and I know London. We know it pretty well. How safe do you feel when you're walking around London? Let's assume you've been there for the first time as some of our listeners. How would you feel? Um, like most major cities, um, there you need to keep your wits about you in London a little bit. You're not going to see like major crime, um, like you may see occasionally reported on the news if you're sticking to these kind of key areas. Most of the crime that happens to tourists is um, is things like pickpocketing and things like that. So just keep your bag secure, keep your passport safe. Um, and the key to it really is to not to look too much like a tourist. And that's actually a really big tip for Americans. Although I'm saying wear comfortable shoes, things like sneakers and jogging bottoms and sweatshirts aren't going to be very welcome in a lot of restaurants and establishments. So you need to dress slightly more smartly than you might expect. Casual dress in England means a bit smarter than you're used to. And dressing like that anyway is going to make you look less like a tourist. Um, there are some tricky areas in London, but I don't think you would necessarily experience them as a tourist. Just keep your wits about you. Statistically speaking, London's still one of the safest cities in the world. So I think you, Got it. you're pretty good. You're going to see you're going to see a lot of police and around major um, attractions and tourist areas. You're going to see armed police, which is still pretty unusual for London. But um, yeah, generally speaking, it's a pretty safe city. Just keep your wits about you. It's opportunistic crime that will catch most people out. And that's going to be things like, you know, leaving your bag slightly out of reach or your purse open or things like that. Just be smart. Obviously, be safe, be smart, and have common sense. It's a capital city, like we talked about Berlin. So there are a lot of police on the street, mm -hmm. and that that's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think you need to fear. Good, great. Is there anything else you want to tell us for this one? Because we could actually talk about this one all day and all day tomorrow and all day the next day. I think as a, a primer for London, I think we should leave it there. My key recommendation is to follow the link to the Explore Europe guide to London have a look at those itineraries that I've put together so I think when you get to London as you recommended jump on a hop on hop off bus then choose an area that you want to explore go back pick one or two areas a day nothing more than that look at all of the free or cheap recommendations that we've given you so sky gardens instead of the shard cheap theatre tickets going to museums that are free walking everywhere, exploring your um, street food options and just really get stuck in and explore the atmosphere and soak up the atmosphere in London. Yeah, and there is a good atmosphere in London. So uh, everybody should get there, enjoy it, soak it up, be safe, be on your guard, have fun, enjoy London. You're not going to make loads of friends everywhere, but sit down, <laughs> sit down. Get We're not as as you're making out, John. <laughs> but sit down and get in a pub or get in a coffee shop and actually see London as it is, as the real London. And the best way to do it, as you've said, and I hate saying it because you're, you're defeating my hop on off bus. The best way of doing it is walking, but the hop on off bus is a pretty good second. And the boat. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Absolutely. I think there's plenty there to get you started on your first trip to London. Once you've been, you've, you've discovered some of the key sites that you want to go back, then maybe you can book in advance, pay to go into some of the big sites and get the best out of them. But for your first trip, I hope there's plenty here to, uh, to, to get you going. Good. And uh, something I don't think we've said, and we should say, we've mentioned it in our, our show notes. If you're going to London or if you're going to one of the other cities we've talked about, please, please feel free to email us or text us or get in contact somehow. We are grateful to give you some tips because we feel passionate about what we're doing and we want you to enjoy the places we're talking about because we've enjoyed them immensely. Now, I'll put ways to get in touch with us in the show notes, but if you're looking for some recommendations for any of these places that we talk about in the show, we'd be more than happy to give them to you. Great. I'm, I'm glad we think the same, Michelle. <laughs> okay, well... That's enough from me today because I've got to go and actually do some work. So, uh, me too. <laughs> all right. Well, it's uh, thank you very much for listening from Ramstein and Michelle. Thanks for listening from Mannheim. I really hope you get to London and please drop us a note and let us know how you get on. See you in the next episode, Explorers. Oh, my goodness. What an episode. I really hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it for you. 
It's hard for me to describe what London means to me in just a few words because it means everything. When I took my first job in a local shop near Cambridge at the age of about 13, my bosses, who were ex-Londoners, said to me, move to London, Michelle, that's where life is. And they were totally right. My first London flat was a studio apartment on the very non-cool end of Labbrook Grove, which is in the rough side of Notting Hill. Turns out it was so uncool that it became hip and my next door laundrette was the venue for the odd music venue. But it was beautifully renovated and I loved it. But boy, was I broke. I used to buy my electricity weekly and shop at a local supermarket just before they closed to get everything discounted. My next flat was in the much more upscale part of Notting Hill called Westbourne Park though it still had some pretty dodgy places around it. It was a rowdy flat share with some good friends and a Danish songwriter also called Michelle. Then I bought a flat in East London, just off Brick Lane. This was before it was uber cool that it is now, which is probably how I could afford it then. I began to explore this part of London more independently and I understood what an unbelievably vibrant part of the city it was. From the colourful curries and the fabrics of Brick Lane to the arts and crafts of Spitalfields, from tasty snacks in Borough Market to the stalls of Tat in Petticoat Lane. East London is where I felt most at home. I really hope you like this version of London that John and I have recommended for you. I think you have to experience London two or three times whilst you're on tour in Germany. And I hope this episode gives you some great ideas to get the best from a first visit as a recce. I hope we've shown you that you don't need to spend a fortune paying to get into famous landmarks or exhibits. There's a huge amount of London that you can see, do and experience for very little or no money at all. Slow down, walk whenever you can or take the boat. Choose one area to explore in a day and then experience it like a local. Look up at all times. You're going to find the most amazing sights, sounds and smells of London all around you. Just absorb the atmosphere and the experience. Then drop us a line or tweet us and tell us all about it. Every week, I'm sharing a sustainable travel tip, and this is the last one of the first series. I hope we can reduce our impact on the planet as we explore more of it by taking these tiny steps that I share with you every single week. This week, I'm going back to plastic water bottles. A million plastic bottles are bought around the world every single minute. If just one person in 10 in Great Britain refilled a water bottle a week, there'd be 340 million less plastic bottles a year in circulation. When you travel to London, please take a refillable water bottle with you and download an app called Refill. I'll include the link in the show notes. Refill is going to show you over 2,000 locations all around the capital of London where you can refill your water bottle for free. This means you don't have to buy a new water bottle and throw it away. I believe the best travellers leave nothing behind but a good impression and take nothing away but great memories. That's the last episode in our first series of Explore Europe, but we're already planning the second series. So I hope you join us again soon so we can help you to get the very best out of your tour whilst you're here in Germany. Thank you for listening to Explore Europe. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and leave us a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you, so tell us in the comment section where you'd like us to visit next. And let us know where you'll be exploring using the hashtag ExploreEurope on Twitter. See you next time, explorers.